Hey, everybody. I am Kenny Bedwell, and I am the CEO and founder of STR Insights. And I'm excited today to talk to you guys about determining revenue with little to no data and how to do that in certain markets. Because there are a ton of markets out there where there is very little to no data, especially when we're going to purchase or add a particular amenity. I can't tell you how many calls I have been on with investors who are either looking to purchase or, you know, added a particular amenity. And uh, they want to know, hey, Kenny, how much can this property bring in? I'm seeing no data on your site, on other sites, wherever it is, it's just not available. How do you figure out what this can do? And, and so I've spent a lot of time trying to research this because um, I can't give them an answer. I can't tell them. I feel confident enough that it's going to do this. So I brought on a, uh, or I'm going to be bringing on a special guest. Um, so uh, this is Matt or Matthew McCall Stillman. Um, he is based out of Michigan um, and he does some other stuff too. So let me, let me tell you a little bit about him before we get started. And guys, just so you know, uh, please, uh, if you like what we're talking about at any point, give us some hearts, let us know. Also feel free to ask questions in the comments, whether you're on YouTube or Facebook live. Uh, let us know as we're going, um, especially if you like something, just say, I really like that data point or, you know, metric or whatever we're talking about. Um, if it was helpful for you, we'd love to know. But the questions, we love questions. Matthew loves questions. It's, it's, uh, they're, they're great. And um, he's very helpful, good resource. So let me tell you guys about him and why I wanted him specifically, because um, I've had conversations with him, especially being in Michigan. And some of these markets are super small. Um, and we're trying to figure out, you know, revenue potential, these particular properties. And Matthew is just the guy that like knows, you know, knows this stuff. So he nearly has uh, 50 properties, um, all of them grossing over 100K in Michigan, which that's <laughs> a lot, uh, a lot harder than you think, especially in uh, the Midwest. Um, he also offers a mentorship program to teach Burr, so buy, rent, rehab, uh, repeat, buy, rent, refinance, or I'm, I'm missing something there, buy, rehab, <laughs> refinance, repeat, there we go, method for, uh, so he, he basically teaches people how to do that and partnering in short-term rentals. Um, and he also offers a a la carte turnkey solutions for sourcing, mortgage, furnishing, and management um, and he does partnerships too. So he's got a lot of things going on. So he's not just like, Hey, I'm a realtor to sell you properties. Um, I'm actually here to help you from A to Z. So a lot of people come, they have no experience and Matthew excels in teaching them how and where to find good property. So without further ado, I'm going to bring him in. Hey, 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 what's up? I'm going to switch this around and get us bigger. There we go. All right. Hey, how you doing? I'm great, man. <laughs> hey, thanks for that intro. I really appreciate it. Um, and yes, yes. Uh, to clarify, I don't, not all of them are making a hundred thousand, but we do on average, uh, gross about a hundred thousand dollars across the portfolio. Um, so awesome. yeah, now it that's per month. I apologize. So yeah, it's still doing quite well. Um, what I want to also uh, mention is like we try to pair the Burr method, which is effectively flipping with STRs. That way people have add value plays. And I'm big, big on having like really comfortable exit strategies. That's one thing I think a lot of people don't talk about as a real mm -hmm. estate broker and mortgage broker. I'm here to make sure everybody in our circle is taken care of and getting a lot of wins. So that's what we've been doing. And Kenny, I met you almost a year ago, I think, actually at uh, the STR Wealth Conference. And um, from there, I've just seen you at every other function and we've been catching up, um, gotten got in touch with the SDR Insights uh, platform. And it's been super helpful for me and my clients. I uh, met a lot of clients through there and man, you know, our, our conversations have always been fun. And let's, uh, let's kind of peel open a couple of those, uh, yeah. those uh, sections on the Midwest now. So I want to ask you about Michigan um, and the Midwest. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it, it's this weird, I, I say weird secret that it, it has some of the best, you know, when you're looking at the data, so just guys data. So bear, bear, bear with us here. Everyone watching this, like when you look at the data, the Midwest has some of the best markets in the country, even better than the Southeast um, and the West, like it has some of the best markets. Why is that? Who is going to the Midwest to vacation? <laughs> Literally, that is the number one question all my clients and all the STR Insight folks always give me is, why do people even come here? Because <laughs> we have people that have stuff in Arizona, Texas, Florida, 
And they're like, they want more Airbnbs. Some of them are also Michigan home based, but they have Airbnbs in other states. They go, why would I invest in my hometown? Like, why do you live here? You know, like there's things to do outside of the norm. Right. And I think a lot of people, especially in the markets where they have um, really dense demographics and metro areas, you found that you don't necessarily need a vacation based you know, situation to attract people that want short term stays. In fact, uh, I met one guy. He only invests in rural Airbnbs. He's able to buy them at $100,000 a pop, and he's still pulling like $3,500 a month on each of these. So I mean, wow. that, it just, that's pretty, that's pretty good mo money, especially if you have excellent finance and you can just rinse, wash, repeat that thing. Right. Um, so what, so as for the why, the why is any reason you can imagine. Yes. The Midwest doesn't necessarily have Disney world. It doesn't have, um, you know, the uh, Pacific doesn't have the Atlantic, doesn't have the Gulf. It's not the, doesn't have those things, but what Michigan does have is the Great Lakes. It's probably got the most inland lakes than any other state. Um, and honestly, Michigan summers, I would never give them up. There's something yeah. really special about them. Um, and the fact that actually during COVID, we saw a huge boom um, in STRs and interest because a lot of the people that were in Silicon Valley were like, holy crap, I can get a lakefront mansion for under a million dollars. And these, so these people came out this way and started buying up things for, you know, 700 to a million dollars, got these gorgeous, huge, you know, 4,000 square foot uh, homes that are generally new. Uh, and they're like, Hey, I'm just going to, I'm going to work here. And then once everything kind of got normalized, it went back, but now the Airbnb it and have some of us manage them. Right. So they've been, they were able to go, wow, that actually worked out. I a, a got a beautiful property. Um, I'm actually building equity now stuff. I can't really do as easily in Silicon Valley. And I'm seeing more and more non-Michigan people invest in Michigan because the ROI is there. And like, you know, I call them, sometimes people need what I call a tester deal. Like they, mm -hmm. I get them something that's like in that 250 to 300 range, let them see that it can function effectively here. And it's like, it's a pretty like safe range. If you needed to resell it, it's usually still in a primary market where somebody that wants to buy a primary or secondary uh, home, uh, they can go in there and swoop it up pretty quickly. You won't be sitting on the market for months. You'll be, you know, if you're on the market, you probably be gone 30 to 45 days anyway. Um, please note all the panic and mayhem when you hear about Airbnbs being oversaturated. What they're usually talking about is all the Sunbelt action, right? Where all the yeah. density is, where all the massive like competition is. The Midwest, however, does not have it. So what's crazy is this is what I'm seeing some of the people that invest in Florida and, and Texas do. They bring their higher level quality up to Michigan and they crush it because Truthfully, that's the thing that where Michigan is lacking. We don't have enough competition where iron is sharpening iron yet, right? So mm. you can put together like a decent place and it can just, it can stand out because there's not a lot of great stuff up here. Um, but now that we've kind of figured out what our secret sauce is, um, we're able to duplicate that at a pretty accelerated rate. And we're just, we're racking them up for us, for ourselves and our clients. And a lot of people love that you can buy, you know, a real, you can get, I can get people lakefront from like, 350 to 600 pretty comfortably and you know 2,000 square feet and they can pull off like 150,000 in gross income so it's like when you're doing that you're like pretty good return right, right. so we're seeing a lot of that some people want the 250 range you're going to definitely be north of 500 and your purchase maybe 750 but to get that that level of gross um income versus the expenditure of the home it's it's a great ratio up here yeah that's that's really interesting so yeah, I mean, what would you say? We'll, we'll say the lake areas, um, you know, some nicer areas in Michigan. What would you say the average revenue would be in those type of markets that you've seen from your experience? I mean, it's kind of a, on the spot, you know, no, like tell us I'll, the answer. <laughs> I would say for a well put together, probably four bed, two bath. That's typically what my my mix. I like to find properties that are like that, or make buy three ones and make them four twos. Um, I would say you're going to average about a hundred thousand and you can probably stay again, you can be under or close to 400. Um, that's the average thing that we see. Okay. If you're doing a really good job or you're able to, you know, you have a, you have a hot tub jacuzzi situation, um, a really great deck. Um, you can see that 150, 250 range pop up real quick. Depending on, also dependent on how much frontage you have. Do you have a dock? Do you have, um, a few other amenities. Do you have an EV charger? Like these little things where people go, like, think about it. Like for all the, the uh, electric car owners in the area, especially in the Midwest, like I want to go go to the lake. 
one of the first things you're going to do if you're an electric car owner, that's all you have is you're searching by EV charger first, right? For like, right. I need to know what's, what's going on. Like one of our guys, Jeremy, he got one on Houghton Lake, beautiful house. Um, he's got an electric car charger. He's going to be one of the first people to have an EV charger option on Houghton Lake, which is one of the biggest inland lakes. In, it is the biggest, I think, actually. Um, and I think he's going to he's going to pull a lot of revenue and he's going to do really well. Uh, also an SDR Insights guy. Um, but uh, yeah, we see a lot of range, man. But to get to that 200, 250 range, um, the fact that you don't have to be at nearly a million like so many other markets is just it's amazing. And, and just to clarify, when you're saying two hundred thousand dollars of gross revenue to two hundred fifty thousand yeah. dollars, and then <laughs> purchase price is still under a million, mm -hmm. is that what you're saying? Correct. Yeah, okay. I, I almost always speak in annualized gross. Um, I love it. Versus, you know, and that's the thing. Let me, let me be very upfront with you. If you bought a property, and sorry to some of my clients that understand this, if you bought it, and even one of our properties we bought, we didn't get it up and running till January. 10th, I think if you go live in January or February in Michigan, it's not the best. And, you know, we've all been there, but that's why you got to understand there's a cash flow metric. Well, there's a cash flow um, tolerance you need to have, especially in that situation. You, you need to have reserves prepared for a potential slow winter season. Now, there's ways to attract people um, during that season, like having hot tubs, great lake views, ice fishing. Um, Snowmobiling is also a big thing. Um, though, if you have those types of attractions going on, and you know, even some other creative things, we're actually we're working on buying a twelve unit right now. We're actually specifically trying to target having the best winter resort situation possible right now. So that's that's one of the big things we're thinking about. But if you're doing those things, you're going to be able to have a much more comfortable winter. In fact, one of our lakefront properties did seven grand in January, which wow. confused the heck out of me. I was like, well, I will take it. Glad we had that jacuzzi. Oh, yeah. I was like, I'm very happy about that. Um, and our other property up in Traverse, um, that one, that one did pretty well. I think we did eight-ish over there in, in January. And our December was fantastic. By the way, November, December in Michigan, no matter where you are, is really good. The holidays are good. Michigan people come back. Even if they aren't local, they'll go to a beautiful house and stay. They want people are out on the hunt for a great experience. Um and I think that if you provide that, you'll pretty much always stay booked. And I have yeah. a big focus on longevity. I know you know that feeling too, right? Um, we don't do anything. We don't do college dorm level furnishings. Um, we make sure that when we do the rehabs. They're very tasteful um, and they're built to last 10 plus years. So um, I think those are all the things that you want to look for. Are you, let me ask you this though. Um, do you think you, you've been a host for a while now and I assume you're are a host you? Yeah. So before COVID, pre-COVID, someone even asked this question: Were there properties making over one hundred fifty thousand pre-COVID? For me, pre-COVID, what was my best property? I was on my way. No, I was. I not pre-COVID though. I'd say during COVID, I actually, in fact, at my very first property, where when data did not exist, I took a gamble on my gut of what I, I think the market needs a short-term rental in the city. I went for it. It worked out. And that's this is my first one. Let me tell you guys, it was garbage. I did a terrible job on for it. was college dorm level terrible. Ugh. I've redone it twice now. Um, but when I did that, it kind of it gave me a chance to see that, hey, you know what? If you can pick something without any data point or anything else to compare it to, um, based on just like understanding what people need. That's I call it like understanding the negative space. What's not what does not exist there? Is there are there hotels? Is there are there motels? I will target cities that don't even have them. A lot of people target only when they have them, right? I'll mm. target when they don't have them. It's like there's a lack of short term um, opportunity for for people to stay if they want to come visit friends or family, right? So I did that, and that property while we were in COVID, I was I was literally biting my my nails like, oh my god, my my whole empire is about to collapse on me. Is what I thought was going to happen, but what actually happened was some of my long terms. I started, I started getting some slower rents. I had I think only one eviction, knock on something, um, and my short term, like went it just blew past all the long terms. And I said, you know what, uh, my next vacancy on my long terms coming up, I'm going to convert that one too. I converted it to short, and I go, oh my god, I bought this house. I had you love this. I had bought this house for I think I think sixty thousand dollars. Probably put 15 into it 
and it was making about $4,200 a month. So wow. I was like, this is ROI, right? Um, and honestly, once I had my second one up and running, I was like, I think I get it now. And that's when I kind of just went nuts with it. And by the time I met you, I was in the mid twenties um, with my Airbnbs and now we're just growing. We just keep growing from there. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, okay. So let's talk, let's dive more into this, this idea of investing in markets where there's not a lot of data to support, Hey, this is a good market to go into. So for me, that, that's a little scary. Um, so do you continue to do that now? I mean, mark, the market has shifted. Is that still your strategy? Um, and if so, like what, but are there any indicators for you that, Hey, this could be a good market that needs short-term rentals. Like, how do you figure that out? Today? Um, <laughs> that's a really good question. Um, I guess the, the short answer is yes. I'm under contract on 15 more units. Um, so I always say never trust a person that's telling you to buy something and isn't also buying. Right. Um, yeah. I, that's one of my things. Like you, if you aren't in the market, you, you shouldn't probably be telling people to buy. Um, sorry to everybody that's not in that category. Uh, but, um, when I'm looking at properties, um, especially when I'm in an area that doesn't have the data to say, Hey, this Airbnb has, this, this area has history of being successful in Airbnb. I'm looking at what has the attraction been, you know, if I, if I reach out to some of the groups in Michigan or I go find out like, you know, so if you go to Metro tra tra Traverse city, it's like you're going and trying to try to find a bunch of cities, a bunch of Facebook groups about Traverse city. What's the, what's the general, uh, conversation like do i see a lot of people are going there do a lot of people enjoy it are, do they, are they conversationalists i'll google like uh short-term rentals and people who like them don't like them you'll find everything under the sun about that conversation point right so i do a little research um the one i'm looking at right now is in hale michigan which i've never been to hale michigan and until i started investigating to do this 12 unit uh i had no idea and you know even with uh, one of my partners i'm going in on it with uh, we looked up some of the data on STR Insights and AirDNA, and honestly, it was spotty. There's not a whole lot of data proving that this will do well. Um, but we said, hey, you know what? What do we know? What can we, what, 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 what is the negative space? Like what is not existent here that we can provide at this point? So we started looking at of the properties that are there currently, like we saw a couple of three, three beds, some four beds, some two beds, and the property we're buying is a, is a multi-unit of ones, twos, and a three. And I said, okay, well, let's let's kind of do some re reverse um, engineering here, right? As we kind of like dove into this property and saw what the other threes were, A, all the threes up there were generally ugly. Um, they were poorly put together, the furnishing, there was nothing really attractive about it. You'd go there, it's cabiny, mom and pop put it together and said, you can you can borrow it for the weekend if you like, if you want to pay them. That's what it felt like, <laughs> right? I mean, You know exactly what I'm saying. Leave the money in the mailbox and- uh... no, Oh my God. And, and of them, uh, the owners, they kind of, they were trying to show us their, their numbers, which are all pretty much handwritten. Um, we kind of realized like, all right, this property, we can't bet on it. But then we looked at like, how are they marketing it? They had one of their units on Airbnb one. And I was like, like, Oh, it stays full though. I'm like, do you, you don't advertise that you have multiple? I'm like, no, where's your exterior photo? We don't want them to know it's a multi-unit. I'm like, but they get here and then they find out like, what's their reaction? They're like, they love it. I'm like, but you're still not marketing the rest of them. Like that's so crazy to me, right? Yeah. So it's like, you know, as you kind of dive into like these deals um, and kind of figure out like, can you make a property more attractive? Can you create more amenities? Can you market it better? Can you get the SEO? Um, can, you know, if you go on Airbnb and you look at the insights of your listings, it kind of tells you how many clicks it's getting, you know, is it on people's radar? And if it's not, you need to figure out how to get it on people's radar, right? Like we don't change up the hero photos, um, change up the, uh, the title and description um shoot it out to some friends shoot out to the airbnb groups how many airbnb groups are there now like i don't even know anymore right there's probably 30 or so but you can ask for feedback and trust me the internet is not afraid to give an opinion um, right and if you want to grow you got to be you got to be open to that so generally speaking um it's at a place that you want you see value and also let it be known the uh purchase price uh, and, and any other properties around there that are actively listed, that's a really good indicator of what kind of demand and value that, that area attracts. If you see almost everything around there is a hundred grand, I would not recommend it. You see everything around there's about 200 grand. I would not recommend it. There's something that's not attractive or good enough. Like we found some properties 
up. I kind of call it the middle finger. I don't know why. Uh, of Michigan. Um, Doing the hand thing. Yeah, yeah dude, we, we are hand people. Um, <laughs> but there is a house that one of my clients wanted to go see. We went and saw it. it was, I mean, it was in the boonies, middle of nowhere. Um, and But the price, we were so impressed. I'm like, to have the lake access, to have the structure, to have the finishes. And then we just kept saying, by the time we drove there, it was so annoying getting there. I have two different types of GPSs when I drive Michigan, and both of them failed me. And I just said, dude, think about how much trouble we just had getting this, right, getting here. That There's a reason that this thing can't be sold right now. So there's, there's a reason it's not on the market. So if you see something not sitting, it either needs a, a substantially lesser offer or it's over because it's overpriced or because, well, in addition to that, because it's just, it's not a good property. It's not a good area. There's not enough desirability and if you do buy it and the Airbnb fails, you're now stuck with an asset you can't liquidate, right? So mm -hmm. that's why when you're typically in that 250 north or higher range, um, you usually are in an, in an area that's dense enough or attractive enough at that average like uh, sale prices or act active listing prices around there, where if you did need to exit, you can do it relatively safely. I've, I've seen that in a lot of markets. Of course, it's going to depend on, you know, if you're in downtown uh san francisco that'll be a different number i'm sure right uh, but you know you got to look at your averages you want to be able to to exit safely or do long-term rent mid-term rent whatever yeah so are, are there markets still untouched markets like this in michigan in the midwest that you found recently or does uh, everybody are is everything kind of discovered at this point from your perspective? oh there's plenty left um you know, a lot, I think on STR Insights, I think it's, is, is it Boyne, Boyne City or Boyne Falls is, is one of the top picks. Yeah. Um, a lot. And that's the number one thing that people usually bring up to me. Uh, they go, hey, well, how, what do you think about Boyne? Like, Boyne's great. Problem with Boyne is almost all of it is in an association, which automatically puts you in regulation city, right? So, um, and there's a lot of other cities that have great ROI besides Boyne um, and accessibility. And that's what I want to talk to you guys about. Like, there's markets on the west side of Michigan, um, near Mears, um, just outside of the Grand Rapids area, even in southeast Michigan, where I'm from. Um, I got a lot of stuff in central in central metro Detroit that really performs well. We got some stuff that you know averages 30% cash on cash. And again, the liquidability, the, the liquidity of those assets is also quite high. Um, beyond that, um, the property I've been talking about referencing is Hale, which is up about here. Oscoda, Oscoda, yeah, you know, we have Oscoda over here too. Um, that's generally built up, but it's mostly commercial, like small little hotel resorts. Um, I think there's a really good opportunity for people that bought houses along this coast of Michigan um, to really like exploit and create that comfort. One of our other clients bought one up here in Alpena. Um, and they're, they're on their way, man. It's actually become like a really uh, quaint, town there's a lot of growth up there um beyond that a lot of people are interested in the up the upper peninsula uh, which is like this <laughs> yeah like the hand yeah, yeah well, just so you guys know people in the midwest when they refer to their state they do hands like this is what michigan looks <laughs> like yeah yeah <laughs> um so. but if you know about if you've heard about pictured rocks i presume pictured rocks it's oh, like, yeah, 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 yeah. Isn't it a gorgeous. national shoreline or something like that? Yeah, it's just beautiful, man. Um, don't get too close. Uh, we were within a week of rocks falling on our head one time, and that would have absolutely killed us. Um, but oh, okay. you don't want to get too close, I promise. Like, stay probably 50 yards minimum back from that thing because um, occasionally they fall. But um, there's a, a little place called Uncle Ducky's. Uh, which is a good launch point for people that want to kayak along and, and the uh the picture rocks um and look, just take pictures and just enjoy like a nice little 10 mile uh kayak session um but a lot of people launch from there now what uncle ducky's been doing for years is he's got i think it's like 30 yurts there hmm. and i think he charges like a thousand dollars a week and he's booked solid during the summer so you do the math he's doing well you know the cost of a yurt is not much he's got a really nice bathing facility and that's what that people do right but what i'm getting to is there's still not a lot of good airbnbs up there right. um and i think that that like even marquette marquette's like a really big town up there um if you focus on those areas that are kind of under undiscovered on or 
not let underserved underserved right? yeah 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 it does feel like the new world when you're up there it is way supernatural it's supernatural in the sense that like you like you've never seen like such untouched landscape it's amazing um so i think those are great spots i'm not necessarily saying people should jump toward those there is definitely more risk when it's underserved or there isn't as much data um and again the more north you go you have other issues um you have access to contractor issues um people i'm gonna, I'm gonna get some flack i'm sure but sometimes the more north you go the slower things get too um <laughs> <laughs> response one of my go my lakefront properties there i was there like hey you know i think we're gonna have another uh check out tomorrow night and they're like well you know i i wasn't planning to go and clean again until next week is that okay i was like not really <laughs> yeah. like, like i didn't realize we we're gonna have to have this talk like you want me to clean it maybe two three times a week i'm like that's how the turnovers go and they're like oh my goodness you're gonna you're gonna wear me out I mean, how many days a week do you work like only when i will clean i'm like it's not that bad <laughs> like come on man but um you do have those issues when you get into more rural like lakefront areas but you know you you got to know typically hire to with the knowing that you're gonna have to re replace somebody um along the way. I usually try to find three to five of every contractor type I need when I try a new area. Um, Google, uh, Facebook groups, whatever you gotta do, put a post out there um, and don't go for the cheap guy. The cheap guy is almost always gonna be your problem child. You might luck out, but if you just go for the cheap guy, you'll be in trouble. Ask for referrals, not self referrals. You know, mm. just raise your hand. There's, there's a real big difference with that, right? Um, so sorry to kind no, of right. cut you off there, but I want to get more into the data data side of things and understanding when there's a lack of data, what do you, so you've got, you know, you found an area that's um, underserved. You, you know, you see the potential in terms of there's traffic, there's some traffic drivers nearby. Yep. It's accessible. The housing prices make sense. Uh, so there's a, there's an actual housing market there. I think that's important. It's a key metric that you identified. Mm -hmm. um, but what do you do? How do you figure out revenue? And and then let's dive into the example that you and I. So let's answer that question first, and then we'll dive into the example that you and I had talked about a few months ago with a property that uh, I assume you guys closed on, right? <laughs> uh, maybe it was Cadillac. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that was a Cadillac one. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah. Um, so what, yeah. So answer that. How do you evaluate revenue of properties where you have no data in those areas? So this is tough and I apologize because I know that we I haven't been super direct about this because sometimes it's hard to without bringing up, at, you know, SDR insights for that matter. Um, so if we're going to, I'll, I'll use the first property again, because I think that's just the easy one to kind of describe the scenario around that property has a generally an older clientele um it's in a city that's it's well maintained everything's going well there's just not really many hotels or motels when i saw that and i saw that its proximity to detroit was um I don't know, within 30 minutes and detroit was doing really well i said okay with, with the few that i had even seen in detroit and there's nothing in this city um i go all right i might as well i might as well you know presume presume if i take this detroit home that's also a two bed um and that t that two bed was making about fifty thousand. and i was like okay it's an okay looking thing my house is nicer than this and plus not only is this city generally like nice and it's got older folks that might want to get visited by you know, uh, family and friends um it's also pretty close to detroit river uh, and there's some really nice walkways there's a nice little downtown there and i said my gut tells me this should work it's, it's still within 45 minutes of the airport. It's within 10 to 15 minutes of a couple uh, local hospitals. I saw all these factors that I said, hey, proximity is looking pretty good, right? And I saw one property that I was, like I said, this two bed that was within 30 minutes of it. I was like, you know what? I feel like it, if it hits 75% of what that does, my property is more attractive and I can market better than that person, which I'm sure I can. I should do well, should do very well. And so I did that. And sure enough, like the first month, we actually, uh, I think we were profitable our first month, definitely by the second month. Um, and that was kind of one of our first moments. The second property that was, that had no data, there was no Airbnbs in that city. Um, it was adjacent to another couple of cities that I liked. I pretty much was picking properties adjacent to other successful um, cities. 
So I do think that that's always going to be a good thing. Pick a property. Uh, there, there, there's, there's our to, to reformat that title. Pick properties adjacent to very successful cities. I'm sure you can do well. Presume some kind of lower occupancy, maybe a lower uh, average daily rate. But if you're also getting that purchase price at a significant reduction, you know, effectively it's a break even. You should have similar cash flows, right? Mm. For NOIs. Um, and then from from there, that's when I said, you know, I want to get a little more risky. I want to break into the markets I like. I said I wanted to get into a lakefront property. So I looked at this property. This was in Traverse, actually. Um, and this one was kind of this one was kind of a Hail Mary because for me, uh, it was coming up to our, our wedding time. We we're getting married in Traverse. And uh, we were noticing um, because we picked Labor Day weekend, which was cool and also foolish. Um, everything was booked. All the hotels were pretty much booked. The uh, most of the Airbnbs were charging a thousand dollars a night. And I was like, oh, my God, a thousand. I wish I was making that money. Light bulb. I'm like, I could do this. I could do this. I said, you know what? I'm going to buy a really nice big house for my wife and I. And we're going to we're going to plan to have this and keep this. We had a big discussion. Um, she didn't love it because we closed two weeks before the wedding and we furnished it within two weeks, which was mental. <laughs> uh, um, we, it's amazing. We did not get divorced before <laughs> at that point. Uh, but at, in that moment, um, we said, hey, worst case scenario, this is going to be a beautiful second home for us. And we're OK if it breaks even. Now, we had no idea how well it would do. We had seen that some properties in the area when they were lakefront and just gorgeous with a good, you know, beautiful dock to use. Um, some of them were making 200. And I was like, well, that's cool. But our thought was, hey, this is close to some wedding venues. This is still Traverse City. It's still got lake access. Like you could walk down. It wasn't lakefront, but it was lake access. And I said, you know what? I'm going to take the gamble on it. I think it's going to break even worst case scenario. We did it. We did it. We launched officially in October. Our wedding was in September and we were actually profitable our first month again. And wow. it was amazing. I couldn't believe it. And now we've had, I think our best month other, ever was 11 K there. Um, and we're like, geez, this is, this was a really good move. And that was, it was almost a $600,000 purchase. Um, and now it's definitely worth more than that. So once you factor in the appreciation of these, that's great. Um, but I had to identify what I felt, even though I couldn't find a perfect comp, because it was lake access, right? On uh, It was about a mile away from the lake, but lake access. Um, it was a big, beautiful house. And I just said, I know I can make this something special, right? Based on the houses that are on the lake and off the lake, but making a lot less, I said, I can make this hybrid uh, home into something that will attract people that want the wedding venues and things like that. Because that's what we wanted, right? We wanted the, the wedding venue access. And I'll tell you, that's a market, man. That is a market. And that's what will bring me to, I'll, I'll talk to you about Gun and Cadillac next. Um, so Gun Lake, I went with a couple friends for a few years to Gun Lake, which is kind of between Kalamazoo and uh, Grand Rapids. Um, and it was, it was just one of our, my most favorite summers I've ever had. I just, there's something, I don't know why they call it Gun, but it was, it's, it's a good time. It's a really good time. And I said, you know, what? I kind of want to get a property up here. And my buddies, he said, you know, what? I'm going to get one too. So we both bought a property. We went for it. And I was looking at some of the data. Um, this one was, this one actually turned into a really big pain in the butt because we were supposed to have dock access and the association ruled that we didn't. And it was also, that's still a fight, but we still have access to the water, long story short. We definitely have lake, at least we have lake views too. Um, but with this property, we bought it at a pretty solid discount. I think we bought it at 265. We put about 40 grand into it, then furnished. Um, but this property, I saw, I saw some properties on that lake that were making 150. I saw some that were making 50 as well. Um, that's the tough part when you see so much variation because some of them suck. And also, a lot of people, especially in strong, heavy seasons. Actually, I guess that happens even on the on the coast, um, the the, o the oceanic coast. Some people shut them down for a series of months, right? Um, and because of that, that those you can't see that the there's income drivers during that period. Um, so sometimes we, you're only getting a blip of a shortened timeline of, of what that gross income was for that property. So it's, it's really hard to discern sometimes whether a property is doing well, if it's, or if it's just been on for a short period, maybe they just got up and running in the last six months too. That's another factor. Right. Um, so deciphering that data is a real big factor. Um, that being said, 
Um, we said we want to go for it. The purchase price was still tolerable. If we needed to sell it as a flip, we went, we knew this, our big thing is always having an exit strategy if you haven't like kind of put that together. But we bought it and you know, our best month so far has been 11 k uh, We've had a lot of 5K months. But again, on a note for 265, mortgage note from 265, it's, it's very tolerable. I think this is going to be our this is going to be our first full summer coming up, um, and we're expecting a lot of like 10k months. So That's it'll awesome. be, yeah. And yeah, last year, big. our biggest purchase was Cadillac. Um, that's a 4,000 square foot house, six beds, three full baths. It's got a pool and a jacuzzi. It's a block away from Lake Cadillac. Um, so yeah, let, let's. Let's dive into this a little bit because sure. we're talk we've talked a lot about purchasing. And one of the things too, guys, everyone listening is when you're purchasing to try to find uh, in, in a market where there's not a lot of data. The one thing that, that Matt talked about was identifying uh, nearby cities or other areas that have similar comparable properties and help, referencing those to help give you an idea of potential for a particular property. No, you cannot say, you know, that property, that two bedroom in Detroit, you're going to make that same amount as that two bedroom in Detroit, but you can use that as a guide. Um, it's the same thing in uh, other markets as well. Let's say you're in a small mountain town and there, there's a lot of other small mountain towns in a particular area. We, we deal with this in New York, uh, in up, upstate New York, in uh, the Adirondacks. There's a lot of tiny towns and tiny lakes and everything everywhere. And there's not a lot of properties. But if you start looking at the aggregate of the region, you can find comparable properties and you can look at how much they're making as a reference point. Um, and that's really how the best way to really do it is looking in other markets, comparable markets to see what properties are doing there and their performances. Um, and then the attributes that I was talking about with, you know, the traffic drivers is huge. Uh, near, you know, and then the nearby cities and things, and then the exit strategy as well. You can't just buy something out in the middle of nowhere, overpriced, and then expect if you try to exit and sell and expect to sell it for the same price. So that that was that that's really key as well. But let's still go into more about this property in Cadillac. So uh, he, Matt sent it over to me, and it was off the lake. All the properties there were on the lake, and I was like man, you're not going to make any money. Like it's off the lake. Like, why would you? Um, but, but this property was extremely unique. So tell us, tell us about this property and tell us uh, why you felt like it would do as well as what it's doing. Man, you just took me back. I remember th th it was a, a, such a shot to the ego when Kenny said, what are you doing? <laughs> so politely, of course. Um, but I, so yeah, no, this, this was probably my biggest outlier property. The one that was like, it felt like a, as they put it, a full scent. Right. Um, yeah. so we looked at this property. There's, it, it was so visually unique. Every time you look at it, you go, I just got to look through these pictures again, even though we bought it, we'll keep doing that. Right. Um, but it, it's called orange Cadillac because it's pretty much all orange siding, which is really abnormal, but it's oddly attractive and good too. Um, and we were looking at the comps again, like Kenny noted, they were all on the lake. Um, the, the only ones that were off the lake were making like nothing really. Um, and for a half million dollar purchase um, and the kind of rehab and furnishing that this was going to require, it felt pretty, pretty nutty. I mean, I think we probably put in, oh man, probably about 50 in rehab and probably about about 70 in furnishing it was, it was our most our biggest furnish ever a lot of high-end stuff a lot of nice stuff um and it was gonna be very expensive the whole project was expensive but and again it also broke my other rule which is having an, an exit strategy to sell it where there would be good comps there aren't good comps this there's nothing that will comp like this um the only thing that breaks 700 is lakefront so again this was a gamble this was a risk right but then we looked at a couple other things. We started looking at what's been hitting for us. One of my partners, Sarah um, from Carwells, the Carwells, um, they bought a property and a place. Uh, I won't say uh, where it is, but uh, you guys will find out if you look at her up. But it's, it's called Bitely. Um, she used the enemy method. You know, that's pretty much what we've been talking about, right? You find stuff and or Burger King method, right? You let other people be the McDonald's. You come in there and you just do it better and let them take the, all the risk, right? So she did that with that. 
she bought for 300 and she's got a property that has had multiple six, you know, five figure months. Um, and that's kind of what we said, you know, okay, you're making five figures large because you're close to a couple of wedding venues. People wanted to host a wedding at your, your house. I've had some wedding venue interaction. I've had bridal parties. I don't want to do photos at our houses because it's so cute. I'm like, thank you. Appreciate it. Um, even uh, groomsmen parties like I, like we did. Um, so with that, we said, okay, there's five venues um, within about five miles of Cadillac. Uh, we're, we're between Lake Cadillac and Lake Mitchell. We are literally one block off of the downtown walking district. We have six beds, three full baths. Uh, we made a speakeasy style movie room with a with this gorgeous pool table. I'm like, all right, so this this house is just special. It's just completely unique, right? Um, and in that thought, we're like, if we can do something that's so exceptional that whether it's on the lake or not, people can go, I don't know, man. I don't know if I need to be on the lake. This house is too cool. I'll be on the lake during the day. I can still walk down there, have a good time. But during the night, during whatever part of the day I'm here, I'm going to have the best time. I can sit by the pool. I can be in the jacuzzi. I can be in the movie theater. Um, I can be playing pool. And that's that's what we did. And we finally started. We got went live um, mid-January. We've already had our first handful of bookings. People are loving it. The reviews have been amazing. Um, and we're, we have, we're starting to get $2,000 a night for our stays. It's getting really exciting for us. Um, but it took, it took a gamble. You know, we said, how can we make something where even if it's not lakefront, it is so exceptional that you go, I don't know, man, I got to stay here. So that's what we try to do. We try to create that longevity, that thought of such almost the thought that the term FOMO, you know, fear of missing out. Um, we want people to go. If I don't stay here, I'm going to regret it or make it so Instagrammable or you're like, dude, I'm in the coolest place. Check this out. That's what we've been doing. And I think by doing that, you know, you can you can command many markets. You can come in there and be a disruptor in so many ways. Um, so from a cash flow perspective, although I don't think from a sale perspective, unless we get a commercialized um, loan that will look at the actual NOI once we're done with our first year, um, we don't want to necessarily get the value from it in that regard, but cash flow wise, we're, we're hoping this thing pulls in about 250 and 250 down a 500 purchase is pretty exciting. So that, that's awesome, man. And congrats on that. You made yeah. success there. I think, let me just preface everything here, guys. Um, sure. Not for the, the week of heart and making, you know, some of these decisions. Uh, I, uh, I usually teach people beginners, especially don't, don't do something that's not already proven because you're taking on more risk. And so it's really important to understand what he Matt's saying here is that you really need to, un, you need to know he's got a team, he's got professionals, he has experience, you know, and I'm not saying you can't go in any market with no experience, but there's a risk level here. So just be mindful of that. When you make these decisions, the number one thing though, the number one value that he, um, that he, he was talking about what they did in each of these markets is, boots on the ground and understanding that market, being there in person. If the data is not there then and you're like, you know, in a completely different state, how are you going to learn about that market and make a wise decision, a prudent financial decision? You're not. Um, you need to have an expert. You need to work with an expert. And so, um, yeah, I, I mean, some people are asking if uh, we can show example of the, the house. I, I don't I can't like share it on here, unfortunately. Um, so I'll, I'll post it uh, in the uh, in the description or something, a link to that property. Matt, if you're OK with that. Um, but I, I do want to kind of wrap up here and and and, you know, say I like um, the, the biggest things for me and the takeaways is when you're determining revenue or whether it's an amenity or, you know, how much money a property is going to make is understanding what you said are the traffic drivers, the nearby comps. I also recommend to redefine the market boundaries. You know, STR Insights, we've got defined market boundaries as like this area. And it's based off whatever Airbnb and VRBO say are market boundaries. That's how we determine our market boundaries for the moment. Um, it's about to switch to zip code in, a, in less than a month, but hey, that's coming. Um, but right now it's whatever Airbnb and VRBO say. However, that's not really how guests define markets themselves. So 
think about like an area or region is, you know, is a, is a true market and look at multiple regions around, not just that particular area where there might not be comps available. So um, that, that's, that's a big takeaway for me on this and, and kind of what you did, Matt, and talking about um, Bitly and, and, you know, your experience there. Do you have any closing remarks or advice you'd like to give anybody watching about, you know, what you've done and, and kind of this, this idea of like, how to find properties with like no data. You know, I, it's such a, it's such a can of worms question for me because I could talk for hours on this and I can, I still, <laughs> my ADD hit sometimes. Apologies yeah. guys. <laughs> um, but my closing remarks, because I deal with so many first timers is our, um, a deal with trying to find a partner or local or agents, um, that can really like, talking about the brass tax things that that will let you want something that will also tell you no if you have somebody that's always telling you yes 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 there's something weird about that like i think that people need to be able to tell you hey here's your risk they don't talk about what your risk and potential of you know maybe things not working out are then i think you're probably talking to the wrong person because i really that's probably one of the biggest reasons i, I decided to get into coaching in the last years because i felt like a lot of people were just saying, go for it, go for it, go for it. It's this new shiny object. Everybody's going to win. Like, it's not true. I've watched multiple people get burned and it, it's sad and it's not fun and it ruins the taste in your mouth about investing in the future. So my job as a real estate professional, as an investor, is to make sure I'm making great decisions for myself, things that people can um, quantify and also exemplify how I do it. And the only way I can make sure people are doing well and I always have a good name is making sure as many people as I work with, they are getting good wins. So make sure whoever you're working with, uh, make sure however you're approaching it, like get local boots on the ground, like Kenny said, um, try to find those traffic drivers. And plain and simple, if you don't feel good about it, if you don't think anybody would visit or want to be there, it's probably not for you. Whether it's true or not, if you don't want to be there, there's something to be said about that. That might mean that you're not like set up to do this type of investment either. So mm -hmm. I think it's really good. Um, to do a major mindset check and evaluation with how you approach investing in real estate, especially in SDRs. SDRs have a lot of upside and a lot of risk because the regulations keep changing every month. So keep that in mind. Yeah. And that we didn't even talk about that in Michigan too, because it, it's very variable. Um, there's some areas that are strict and some areas that are less strict. Well, Matt, I do, I do want to kind of wrap things up here. So, um, what's the best way to for someone to reach out to you and get a hold of you if, whether they're interested in investing in michigan or learning or uh just about you know investing in short-term rentals um honestly the best thing right now uh if you're on my social medias you can find my link in bio um i got a stand link there um you can reach out to be added to my email list of matt's picks for home for uh, homes here in Michigan that would be great for STRs. If you want to get uh, in touch and apply for our mastermind uh, for mentorships, you can do that. Um, beyond that, if you just want to just mail and see what I'm doing, I'm going to keep sending out uh, pretty much weekly emails at this point. And that's what we're doing these days. So, hey, Kenny, man, thank you so much for having me on the show. Always uh, great catching up with you. And thank you yeah. for everything you do. I'll be on your uh, your March 9th and March 10th uh, um, thing with John. Definitely Sweet. No pressure. That. Right. Yeah. 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 Our uh, data. event. so, yeah, guys also too, I appreciate that shout out there, uh, Matt, but yeah. um, uh, so just everybody listening, we are. So John Bianchi and I did an interview with him. Uh, I think it was last week or the week before. I don't know. The weeks are kind of flying for me. Um, we're hosting a, a virtual data boot camp. We're helping you walk A to Z on how to find profitable cash flowing properties in 2023 and the steps we can make. I guarantee you that um, all, you know, you can, find it or the stuff on YouTube um, or, you know, Facebook, the link into the, the site uh, to, for the event. It's super cheap guys. And it's going to be two days worth of content. Very, very good. You're going to get a workbook. You're going to, we're going to put you to work. We're going to help. You're going to walk away with a strategy uh, to how you can find uh, profitable properties. And you might end up calling Matt afterwards. I mean, like where that, that's the goal is to, you know, actionable items and I think that's, you know, that's why we do it. It's not, um, you know, this isn't some like money grab. This is to help everybody because we've been getting a lot of calls. And frankly, a lot of people are just confused. And Matt, I'm sure you've seen that too. And you've got to educate and teach people. And so uh, this is the way we're doing it. But without, uh, with that being said, guys, if you want to contact Matt, here's his link below. Um, reach out to him. 
he's got a lot of cool courses and content and uh, and a community as well. And so um, he he knows what he's doing. He knows what he's talking about. So uh, I appreciate you having being being on here and talking about this important topic. I feel like a lot of people struggle with it. Um, and so anyway, thanks everybody for for uh, for watching, and uh, we'll see you next time.